What's going on guys, Kevin Fox here from Fox Fishing 4K. So today, we're gonna to be discussing the drop shot and some major mistakes you guys are probably making. Let's get into it. All right guys, so we're coming into fall, salmon season's done. Hopefully you guys enjoyed some of those salmon videos about down ringing, spoons, clips, and all those informational videos. After salmon season's done, I switch gears. I move on to bass, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass. The water's starting to cool. These fish are feeding really heavily in the shallows, three feet of water, eight feet of water, hanging out in weed beds. As we get cooler evenings, these fish are gonna start moving deeper. And that's in the next couple of weeks. We're gonna have cooler nights, the, the water's gonna cool, and some of these fish are gonna push down onto deeper rocky points, submerged shoals, and looking for bait and they're gonna really be feeding to stock up for their winter so this is one of my favorite times to fish these bass and one of the most effective techniques for this time of year and fishing is the drop shot rod reel line leader baits there's so many things to think about and we're gonna go through all of them right now the number one mistake you guys are probably making is having the wrong kind of rod or or reel or just gear in general for drop shotting Drop shotting is a finesse technique. You're not down there just jacking these things with 20 pound braid and 20 pound leaders. You're using small baits. It's a finesse technique. You're keeping the bait relatively close right to the bass. You can usually see them on forward facing sonar or see them on 2D or side scan and casting out to them. And you're keeping your presentation in and around that striped zone as much as possible. When you're doing this, you wanna be using the proper gear. So let's start off with a reel. The number one thing you want with a reel when you're drop shotting is a smooth drag system. My recommendation would be something like this. This is the Pissifun Carbon X 2500. And the reason I recommend this reel is that it's not too big it's great for drop shotting because it has a super smooth drag as soon as you load up on that fish you want your line to be able to just slide right out there like butter like if i take this and i start pulling nice and smooth you want your reel to let out the line easy you don't want any chugging you don't want your rod to bend right over and then the line just goes zzz and come out too quick you want it nice and smooth. Soon as that fish starts moving, the reel is going to start letting out line. That's gonna keep the hook pinned in the fish's mouth, keep the tension, not snap you off, especially if you're using light line, because it is, again, a finesse technique, and it's gonna keep that fish pinned. Those ones, I would say, are about 80 bucks, and you're going up to the next reel. Then I would recommend the Fluger series. This is a Fluger Supreme 2500 series, again, this is probably 149, 160 Canadian. Maybe you can get a deal on at Cabela's or somewhere, but this is the next step up for a reel. If you're going up above that, you might wanna look at uh, the Daiwa Ballistic, or you could look at something like uh, a Shimano Stratic. This one's a little bit heavier. I got a jigging spoon on here. This is a 3000 series, but if you're drop shotting, I'd be doing a 2500. But a Stratic CI4, uh, I'm not sure if they still sell these or not, but uh, if they are only Vanfords, that would be the next step up. Just grab a Vanford 2500. So that's what you want for a reel. Nice, easy drag. Next, we're gonna talk about rods. So when you're looking at rods for drop shotting, you don't want something real super long. A lot of times you're doing not huge casts. So I would say anywhere from something like a 6.6 six to a 7.3, you're good. And I would say ideally a 6.9 to a 7.1 for myself is would be perfect. Some people might like like a 6.10. And I would say for starting off, you have minimal amount of rods, get a medium. If you're gonna have a specific rod just for drop shotting, even go down into like a medium light. And the medium light is gonna help you a little bit more when you get into lighter lines, which we'll discuss in a minute. So those are some of the rods that I would choose. Uh, I've got one here. This is a Fenwick World Class. I use this for drop shotting. This is a 610 medium light, extra fast. And it's a uh, line weight, four to 10 pound line. And, and that's probably a good ballpark. Uh, I would say if you're drop shotting, 
I wouldn't go up 10 pound, I would say eight pound would be the max, because again, finesse technique. I would say somewhere in the four to eight pound range. So we've talked about rods, we've talked about reels, let's talk about line. Now, I can't stress this enough, line is one of the most important things when you're drop shotting, and I'm gonna show you why. One, you wanna run a fluorocarbon lead, but you really wanna have a fluorocarbon lead just because it's harder for the fish to see in the water, the diameter's really small, and it's gonna give you a lot more action on your baits. This is in Vizx, and this is, let's say six pound, this is diameter 0 0.008 for six pound, okay? Six pound. Now, if I look at something like, this is four pound Ber Berkeley Vanish, this diameter is 0 0.007 for four pounds. So Berkeley Vanish for four pounds is 0 0.007. Six pound in Vizx, 0 0.008. And, and you might guys might not be thinking that's not much, but if you're talking in terms of 0.7 to 0.8, probably looking at a 13 to a 15% increase in diameter, which is significant when you're doing a finesse technique. But because I am a multi-species angler and I just don't focus on bass, I do a lot of river fishing, steelhead fishing, and I take a lot of the best techniques from one type of fishing and I bring them over to bass. And from bass, I bring stuff over to river fishing. And one line that I really, really like, FC Sniper, this is like my go-to. A new one that I just started is Frog Hair. Now, any of the river guys, you're gonna know what I'm talking about with frog hair if you're a river rat. So if you're ever trying to do like a line class or break a line class record, this is IGFA rated, so that'll come in handy. The IGFA rating means it's actually been tested. So a six pound test on this will actually break at six pounds. Not only that, the diameter on this line is very, very small. It's got four spools and they all clip together. So this one here is 11 and a half pound. 10 pound, now four pound, six pound. And okay, here, perfect, perfect example. Six pound frog hair is 0 0.007. So for six pound, 0 0.007, and here's six pound in Vezex, 0 0.008. So there it is, exact comparison. So same pound strength, tensile strength, but you're getting 15% less diameter with the frog hair. And you might be saying to yourself, who cares 15%? Well, what that means in terms of being on the bottom is movement. Again, this is a finesse technique. When that bait is sitting down there in front of the fish, you might have currents down there, water moving, any vibration from your rod going down the line is gonna cause movement for that bait. The more movement that bait can do down there, the better. To an extent, okay, we should almost start talking about cadence. It's to an extent. You want your bait, when, you, when you're not moving, the bait to flow like this in the water, okay? You want that bait to move with the current. When you have the lighter lines, this is where it's crucial. Those lighter lines are gonna help your bait flow in that current. The thicker your line is, the less movement you're gonna get from natural currents and things like that. So this is where going down, dropping down from an eight pound to a six pound, or even a four pound on really, really clear water and really, really stubborn fish is beneficial. Again, River Act guys, Niagara, depending how clear it is, you guys know how going from eight pound to six pound or six pound to four pound can make all the difference when you're steelheading. The same is for drop shotting for smallmouth. Now goes into baits. Let's say I have a bait down there. I could have like a tiny little minnow fluke. I could have something like a duo realis wriggle claw worm, crawl worm, a KVD uh, dream shot. These are all different kinds of soft plastics for drop shotting. It's all gonna add movement to them. So let's start talking about drop shotting and another mistake you might be making is the type of bait for the style of fish or the I would say the aggressiveness of the fish. You pull up to a shoal, you've got your line set, you got the right gear now, what bait do you use? Okay, so if you're starting off, you're not sure what kind of bait to throw, throw on a worm. Wriggle crawler, what's this one? This is a 3.8 inch, a rather clear color. Get something like green pumpkin, 
uh, clear, if you're fishing clear water like Simcoe, uh, out in the Far Islands, Georgian Bay, stuff like that. Start with this. And with that light line, that worm's gonna do this in the current. You can wacky rig it. Uh, however you wanna rig it, you're gonna get a ton of movement from this worm. If the fish are more aggressive and you don't have to be that finesse with them, you can start moving up to stuff like the KVD Dream Shot or something like a flatworm. Something that's a little bit bigger and it's got a tail on it. Now with that worm, with the current, that tail's gonna move like this, especially if you start doing a little bit of a wiggle and then you let it sit, that, that's gonna entice that fish. If you're finding they're real aggressive, they're shooting up six feet or coming a few feet to look at your bait, then you don't. You can go even a more aggressive style bait. This would be something like a hasdong, a type of swim bait with a paddle tail. One of my favorites, X-Zone Stealth Invader. And this is one thing that I will throw a lot, especially if you don't have forward facing sonar, you only have 2D sonar, or you're not marking a ton of fish, but you wanna search bait them. I'm gonna have something like this, either a hasdong, spark shad, or stealth invader with a paddle tail on it. Pull it like this, the tail's gonna kick, let it sit. Pull again, let it sit. Again, this is a finesse technique. You're not just ripping it. Any of the worms, you're not going like this with your rod and freaking right out. I see so many people do that. They've got the rod in their hand, and this is them with a drop shot. They cast out, and I see them shaking that rod like this, and then stop, shaking that rod and stop. Or they're pulling, they're like, pull back, drop, pull back, drop. No, no, don't do that. That's probably a mistake you're doing. You wanna to try to keep your weight in contact with the bottom at all times. With those worms, cast it out, let it sit. Another thing, when you cast it out, leave your bail open, don't close it. When you fly that bait out, don't close your bait because what's gonna happen is the bait's gonna hit the water and if your line is closed, as it sinks, it's gonna pendulum back to you. You just lost all this distance. So if you cast out 80 feet and you close your bail, as this swings, you might lose 10, 20 feet of distance. Let it open your bale, let it hit bottom. Once it hit bottom, once it hits bottom, close that bale, keep the line tight, bring it up, and just let it sit for a minute. If you want to, paddle tail, bring it forward like a little drag, let it sit. The worms and everything, you might give it a little bit of a wiggle like this, or even just let it sit in the current for a minute, and then pull, and then let it sit. A lot of times you're gonna get your bites almost when you're not even wiggling it. Like when you stop moving it, and you're just leaving your bait there, that's when you're gonna get your strike. Sometimes too, I will even hold my rod, I'll keep it tight, I'll pull it, I'll actually push the tip of my rod back a bit and let it go slack. So what it does is the bait actually isn't held tight on that line anymore, it actually starts to kind of sink, and as it sinks, it'll kind of be going like this. And a lot of time, that slow fall action, the bass are gonna come out and strike. So those are some of the different baits. And don't get hung up where it has to be a worm or a swim bait. You can drop shot anything. If the fish are feeding on crayfish and stuff like that, you can throw something like this. Here's a crayfish, this is the OSP. Here's another one. These are the uh, Do Live Craw, the four inch. You can throw these on a Ned, but you can throw these on a drop shot too, guys. Then we're gonna talk about line height. So if you're gonna do something like a crayfish, just have it up four inches off, off your weight. Four to six, I wouldn't go any higher than six and I wouldn't, oh, you can go lower than four, you can do whatever you want, but I would say around four is, is a good height. And what's gonna happen is that bait's gonna sit there, the claws are gonna float up kind of in a defensive mode and that's really gonna react to those bass if they're out on those shoals going around rocks eating crayfish. So experiment with your baits, experiment with your line height, go lower for the um, craw baits, go higher for minnows and paddle tails and worms. And or if the fish are really shut down and you can see them on your sonar, whatever height you see the fish are, try to match that with your drop shot. If they're real shut down, they're hiding by rocks, sitting right on the bottom. Sometimes you have to have even those worms and everything only a four foot or four inches off the bottom and wiggling right in front of their face for almost sometimes 20 seconds to get them to bite because they're so shut down. So that's about the height. I suggest if you're gonna do it, set up a box like this. This is my drop shot box. If I flip that up, you can see a bunch of different weights, hooks in here, 
I have a bunch of different weights. I've got uh, 3 16 quarter ounce, 3 8 You want to have a bunch of different weights for different depths. Uh, not only that, different size hooks. Let's speak about hooks. Uh, I think I have some here. Some people will throw on like an EWG or they'll actually buy like a Gamagatsu drop shot hook. And I'm gonna say, just because people see Gamagatsu and they see drop shot hook, nine times out of 10, people grab that hook. Don't do that. So the reason the drop shot or a Gamagatsu drop shot hook is not very good is because of the size of the gap on the hook. So when you see that hook, let's say it's kind of, if I can hold my finger, uh, like this. Do you see that gap? Here, let me grab a hook. Okay, something like this, okay? Here's a drop shot hook. I don't ever use this. This is something pretty big. I wouldn't use this for bass. But where you see the tip of this hook here, and you see the gap to where you tie the drop shot, your line's gonna run through on this metal. This one has it built in, so you just tie to here, and then you clip on more line down to your sinker. But you see this space from the tip to where it ties? That's the gap. Like, I can put one finger in there, basically. And this point, if I lay this top here and it lays flat like a table, this part, I look where my tip is. See that tip? It's in line with that. So what ends up happening when you use a hook like this and Gamagatsu drop shot hooks are like this, is you end up skin hooking those fish on the mouth. If you're ever drop shotting, you find zip, you hook up on them, you got them, you start fighting them and it's like, it's off. You're like, what? How did that happen? It's because of this gap, okay? That point is probably in line with where your knot is or your tie. So what you wanna get are hooks that have a wider gap there. Now, I'm not saying like an extra wide gap, but what I'm saying is something like a mosquito hook, an owner mosquito hook. So a little bit bigger so you guys can see it too. If you see this one, you see where that flat part is? Look how much higher that hook is. You can see that hook point. If the, my line was tied on, that hook point's actually above where the hook goes or where it ties. It's actually above that. So what's beneficial about that is, as soon as that fish bites on here and you set, all this space in here is gonna be hook penetration. That's gonna push the hook a little bit further back. It's gonna get into one of the top pallets of the smallie and it's gonna bury into that bone enough where you're hopefully sink that barb in. That way if the smallie's jumping all over, you're not afraid of losing them. So hooks are very important. If you're looking at a hook, my recommendation is a number one or a number two owner mosquito hook. Can't go wrong with them. They got an extra wide gap. They've got the right size wire for drop shotting, ultra sharp. You set on those, you're gonna get those fish or you're gonna land a lot more. So the next thing we should talk about is style of hooks. That's one style of hook. With those hooks, the way those are set up, those are for setup for nose hooking. So let's say your flatworm or your X-Zone Stealth Invader, it's gonna go right through the nose of that bait. And as you pull it, the bait's gonna come along. Where those type of hooks are not good is if you're fishing weeds, logs, any kind of structure. Let's say you're fishing a shipwreck down below because that exposed hook and that extra wide gap is likely to get hung up on some debris, hung up on weeds, stuff like that. So what you wanna do is go to like something like a straight shank hook. I don't know if I have any in this box. No, they're in my other box. You wanna go with another straight shank hook. And the reason you want a straight shank hook is you can bury it into the bait at the top of the head, have the hook almost or just barely extruding out of the worm, whether it's a robo worm or whatever you're using, barely coming out of it. And when you drop shot into structure weeds, it's not gonna hook up on those. The other thing I'd like to mention is knots. How do you tie a drop shot? And this is a big one. So I hear a lot of people, they do like a fisherman's knot and they put the line back through the hook and pull it tight and they're good to go. You can do that. I mean, if it's working for you, give her. Um, I would say if you're gonna take it one step further, do something like a polymer knot. Put your line through the eye from the front, back through, you got your loop, you come around, go through, put the hook through, pull it tight, make sure you bring your tag back through the eye, pull it tight, and that's gonna hold your hook up and out straight. Now, 
there's another version you can do, and I actually prefer this one, just because this one's actually gonna hold the hook out even further. It's not gonna have line twists and things like that, and you don't have to go back up and through the hook again. The way you tie it is you take your line, you go through here, loop around, and now you start twisting. You twist and you twist and you twist and you twist, put your hook through, pull that tight, and it's gonna give you a knot above and below that eye of the hook. So this is gonna hold that hook right there. You cinch that tight, it's going to hold your hook right in place. And I really, really like this knot. This is one, if I'm tying a drop shot, I'm gonna do nine times out of 10, just because it holds that hook straight out. I'm not having the hook hang down. It, it's a, a much better presentation and it'll help with hook up ratio. If everything's working for you and, and it's perfect and you think some of the stuff I'm saying is completely wrong, comment below. My videos are here for people to take what they want from them. If they watch it and they say, hey, you know what? Everything he mentioned, I'm doing better myself and I don't need any help, that's cool. That's awesome. There's a lot of people out there curious about this information, struggling or just starting out. So if you see them struggling and they're asking about a drop shot, forward this video to them and have a good one. Tight lines, guys. Bye-bye.